soul? Is this something in our brain? Is it something in a different dimension? The best way that I can be fulfilled is if I care for you. Hello and welcome to today's episode of The Fulfilled Series. Today I have with me a dear friend and esteemed psychiatrist, Dr. Lloyd Setterer. Dr. Setterer is an adjunct professor at the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health. He's also the Chief Medical Officer for the New York State Office for Mental Health. This is his 12th book, which we're speaking about today, The Addiction Solution. And in addition to writing numerous books, he is also a medical journalist and has published hundreds of articles online in various publications, including Psychology Today. Welcome, Dr. Sederer. It's great to be here, and it's great to be part of your work in reaching uh, so many people who want to learn more about how to better their lives. Thank you so much. And I personally am fascinated with the topic of addiction. I wrote a book, Fulfilled, which yes. you've read and which you've you know, reviewed. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> it was my pleasure. Yes, and addiction was one of the chapters. And the way that I framed it was that addiction is one of many soul corrections that people come into this world with. And the soul correction is equivalent to like Freud's repetition compulsion. Those things that come up in our life again and again and again, much to our chagrin and dismay, and often despite our best efforts to yes. change it. And this is uh, about people seeking solutions, perhaps not very good solutions, but to the emptiness that uh, they can experience or the psychic pain or physical pain. Drugs are very effective short-term solutions. They work, they work. but they are not very good long-term solutions. And that is what your book actually offers. It's helping people to understand what the evidence-based, scientifically validated, longer-term solutions are to fill people's inner voids and give them more control over their lives. We have an epidemic here uh, declared by our public health agencies. And public health has a long and uh, distinguished history in beating back epidemics. Think about polio, think about smallpox, think about how we changed our whole approach to HIV AIDS and have succeeded immeasurably, how we've beaten back deaths from car accidents and reduced tobacco smoking and all the consequences of that. These are public health approaches and the same approach can be applied to addiction. And public health rests on certain foundations. Prevention, 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 early detection, early discovery of a problem before it gets too deeply rooted, and then good treatment, which is a treatment that is comprehensive, doesn't just rely on one pr approach. These are complex conditions. You need to uh, put together different approaches at the same time to give somebody a chance. Lloyd, you have such a humanistic heart. You've devoted your life to helping people from a public health perspective and really helping the underdogs on so many levels. Can you talk about what has led you to this kind of work and why this touches your soul in the way that it does? Well, I did make a living as a legitimate uh, doctor taking care of patients <laughs> like you and running clinical services for well over 30 years. And that was very meaningful and I sustained that even uh, after I moved more into public health. But what I learned is that you can't scale up, you can't reach large numbers of people through individual treatment or clinics or even hospitals. And that's where I had an opportunity to go work here in New York City in public health. And public health asks, what, what, do, what are the problems that exist in a population of people? Maybe youth, it may be seniors, it may be people who live in poverty. What are the problems that they have in our case? What are the mental health problems that they have, the addiction problems? What is the prevalence? And what is it that will make a difference in their lives? And that's about policy decisions and financing decisions that support greater access to effective care. And that's a, uh, I, I wanted to do more. And I saw the public health arena as a chance to do that and government as the ultimate public health delivery system. Yes, right, and there's no better person to do it given all of your clinical experience and the fact that you've been exposed really in the trenches, in the front lines. Yeah, well, thank you. That is what informs all my decisions, not just being a, a government bureaucrat, but rather being a doctor, being a clinician who took care of patients and families for decades. I want to speak with you today about your book, which I think is such a gift to our field. So often, so much of what is known about addiction treatment is very much politicized. There's so much criminalization of addiction. And what I really love about your book is the fact that there is this historical, you know, over time, 
really compendium of what has worked and what hasn't, yes. what is supported by science and what isn't. Winston Churchill, one of his famous quotes was, you can rely on the Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. And we still persist in trying to do the everything else, even though the evidence is overwhelming that it doesn't work. And the two principal strategies that go back 100, 150 years are trying to control people's access to substances. Uh, the best example of its failure is prohibition, where this country tried to prevent people getting access to alcohol, and that was a complete failure. And it's a lesson that has been repeated, the war on drugs, Nixon, Reagan, and even the current administration. The other strategy that we uh, are fond of as a country uh, is to scare people, particularly young people, about drugs. It's going to ruin your brain, it's going to destroy your life, it's destroy your health. The irony is that with young people, the more that you introduce risk, the more they're drawn to it. It's an evolutionary thing. Imagine, you know, 50, 100,000 years ago, you wanted the teenager to be drawn towards risk, to leave the home, to find new sources of food, to find mates. So these are absolutely ineffective, very costly strategies that also disproportionately disadvantage people who are poor and of color. Right, one of the offshoots of prohibition was an increase in organized crime. Absolutely, the, more, what, yeah. the more we try to interfere with people's access with what they want, the more organized crime supplies them with what they want. And I was thinking, you know, as you're talking about scare tactics, when I was in elementary school, we had a program called D.A.R.E. and we would have police officers and I think even individuals in prison come to our school to tell us this is why you shouldn't use. Right. Yeah. And, and what was your reaction to that? We were scared. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know necessarily if that fear would actually keep people from not using. There's no evidence it's a deterrent. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of uh, uh, tacky in a way to take a felon out of prison and run that person before people, uh, young people. It's a form of public shaming. It's like a fear-based control system. It's yes. very Machiavellian. <laughs> As opposed to things really which accept, you know, the dignity of a human yes. being and honor their humanity and meet them where they're at. Human beings are also active ingredients in our response to a drug. One, one chapter uh, in the book is called 10 Things That Matter. And these are factors that determine if a person is going to be at risk, if they're apt to become dependent, what their response is to a particular drug or not. There are many factors. We are active ingredients. It's not just the drug, it's the drug and the person. And the person is who we have to reach in order to prevent substance problems and to treat them. And that's one of the points I love that you make in your book, that people use drugs for a very specific reason. They're trying to meet a deep psychological need. Yes. There's not a society on earth that doesn't use intoxicants, not one. And some people say that's evidence that uh, the need to change our brain, to change how we feel, to reduce psychic and physical suffering uh, is as powerful a need as is sex or food or attachment. Given that this is such a problem, what are the key things that families can do, that individuals who have loved ones who are using can do? Can we offer them some guidance? I think so, and I, I believe so. And I devote a good part of the book to helping people understand what addiction is and where they can turn, who they can trust, what good treatment looks like. And you have to be a consumer, a informed consumer, because a lot of the treatment out there is not good enough. And you're apt to be taken for a ride economically and otherwise, and you're putting a loved one in danger if the treatment is not comprehensive, uses therapy, uses medication, supports the family, involves motivational techniques relapse prevention. If you put these all together, and that's what a diligent family or a person seeking treatment has to understand and demand, 
What I've noticed in treating addiction for you know many years myself is that everybody needs a completely different approach. There have yes. not been two people who have healed in the same way or, or who have needed the same things for healing. Absolutely, and, and that's that person-specific approach that you referred to before. It is about understanding who this person is, what their pain is, what their past experience, particularly traumatic experience is, because that's what leaves us all to solutions like drugs. So it is about understanding the person, meeting the person where he or she is, and then building a plan together. I really loved your discussion also in your book about adverse childhood experiences yes. and the many other risk factors that are very person dependent that increase the likelihood that people will use, will relapse, will be able to successfully recover. Adverse childhood experiences are a good example of early intervention. And we can identify children three, four, five years of age who have what are called ACEs or adverse childhood experiences. They've had neglect, they've had abuse, there's domestic violence in the home, there's active substance use in the home, there's multiple foster care experiences. These are cumulative and if, and if a child has four or more of these ACEs, by the time they're a teenager, they're almost certain to have a host of mental and physical problems including addiction. And this is about early trauma. And this is about how trauma changes a person's psychology, even changes their brain uh, neurology and puts them at risk for those solutions, which are not very good. What kind of interventions can start early on in order to be able to... There are some good examples of that, including a program here in New York called Parent Corps. And it is about schools or primary care practices, family practices, identifying these problems. And the solution is not in therapy for the child. It's in enabling the mother or the grandmother to be a more effective parent. So these are skill-based programs. And this one, Parent Corps, is done with preschool kids in inner city neighborhoods where they get together with the moms or whoever shows up to pick up the child at, you know, in the afternoon and have a group together about their learning to be more effective parents. And that quiets the trauma in the home and allows the child to escape the long-term consequences. I'm gonna give you a few um, scenarios. What is somebody who has a loved one who's in denial about alcoholism? What can that person do to help their loved one? There are a couple approaches that uh, are more effective. Confronting somebody with an addiction uh, does not work, or even with a serious mental illness. And what a person, what a family member can start to do is to jot down what they're observing, not what they're feeling, but what they're observing, stays in bed till uh, midday, hasn't taken a shower in a couple of days, but uh, tightens a belt three notches, goes say he or she's not eating. Uh, and then validate what they're observing with someone else who they trust and knows that same person. So you're on a foundation of what's observable, not judgments and not feelings, but what's observable. And then it's a matter of then approaching the person with the condition to, at a time when they're not high or when you've not woken them up uh, you know, in a cranky mood. There are moments where there are opportunities and that's a time to say, uh, let's talk about what I'm seeing and what others are seeing in you. That's really powerful. That's so the beginning of a conversation. And, and you know, don't expect that a miracle is going to happen, but that's how conversation begins. And then over time, family members need to leverage what influence they have. And sometimes that influence is material, like their loved one is living with them, or they're supporting their car, or their phone, or their rent. And I believe in a family, it's a two-way street. You give, but also you get. And that it's reasonable to expect that in exchange for supporting somebody and helping them get into recovery, that they have some basic responsibilities, including taking care of themselves, going to appointments, and working on their own recovery. And I'm sure that's actually quite helpful to the listeners to really focus on more of the empirical observable signs and to use the leverage that people have in helping yes, their loved yes, ones. Yes. That's really beautiful. You're not powerless. Another case. I've had numerous people come in, maybe in their early 20s, using marijuana on a regular basis. Yes. And what do you tell somebody like that? How dangerous is it? Because right now it's becoming legalized both for medical purposes and in some states recreationally. Yes. So how dangerous is it? And how does that vary based on the age at which they use? And what do you say to someone like That's that? That's one of the factors I talk yeah. about in the book because it's very different to smoke or use cannabis when you're 12 
when you're 20 or when you're 30. And that's because, as you know well, that the, our brains are under construction. And they're under construction well into our 20s, later for young men than for young women. And when a brain is under construction exposure to a strong substance, and cannabis is now 60 times more powerful than the stuff that I smoked when I was in college here in New York. That's a very powerful exposure, and you can interfere, a person can interfere with their own brain development. And that's important because the process of maturation called myelinization, the coding of the nerves, the fibers that connect nerves together, is essential for our brains to function well, to, for different parts to communicate with each other, which make a difference in terms of being impulsive or using some judge, good judgment. So uh, it, you know, many families now work to talk to their kids about putting off, delaying smoking because it's ubiquitous, you know, they're, it's all around them. It's about their making more effective decisions to protect their brain and to do better in their lives, in sports, in school, whatever. So Lloyd, we were talking about all the different reasons that people use drugs. Yes. And at the end of the day, it's really about filling a void within them and also filling a deeply important human psychological and at times physical need. Yes. Yeah. So let's talk about why is it that human beings at their core have this void? Where does that come from? Is that just an existential part of being a human being? Here's where your work is so important and where I've learned uh, so much because you've identified the spiritual needs that people have that put them at risk to use substances and to persist in using substances. We all are seeking some type of sense of continuity in life, of some universality in life, some greater power that, not necessarily a Godhead, but a, a, a sense that there's more to life than just our everyday experience and people need to feel that and if they don't they are more at risk to look to something else so we need to give people uh, alternatives spiritual alternatives um, psychological alternatives a variety of mind body alternatives like yoga meditation mindfulness slow breathing and there is even one promising drug that uh, actually turns a person's psychology around. Psilocybin. Psilocybin. Yes, <laughs> yes. tell us about yes. that. Yes, so psilocybin is uh, what is uh, conventionally uh, known as magic mushrooms. These grow naturally in the American Southwest. They're used in native ceremonies. They can be grown in South America. And it's a type of mild LSD high. And what happens uh, during a trip is that a person uh, goes from whatever their ordinary experience is, whatever their suffering is, to having a persistent sense that they are part of a larger whole. A sense of wonder, a sense of awe can be restored. And over 500 of these people have been given a psilocybin trip. And 80% of them went from this state of anxiety and despair to being reconciled with their uh, circumstances with their imminent death. And that the uh, reconciliation is not just during the trip, actually, hardly occurs during the trip. It's in the aftermath of the trip. And of those 500 people, not one had an adverse drug reaction. So none of them got toxic from this substance. That's a remarkable improvement rate. We have no single intervention, one-time treatment that is as effective as this appears to be. What is it that happens during this trip that enables people to have this greater sense of continuity, as you said, and it sounds like a sense of meaning beyond yes. what they had. Prior. Yes, well that comes, the meaning derives, I think, from that uh, greater experience. Uh, the best explanation uh, I've come to understand about what happens here is understood by, imagine uh, a child, a three or four year old child that you know, and that child is running around and she's full of wonder full of awe, you know, of course, until she gets tired or hungry, but she has this experience, this much more universal, awesome experience of everyday life. And then it goes away. 
It goes away in a few years. It needs to go away because mom and dad have to get her dressed. She has to behave in school. She has to eat, you know, vegetables and things like that. So that's a civilizing process. And that happens in a section of our brain, which has a terrible name, called the default mode network. No one can remember that. But it is a part of our brain that is inhibitory. So that sense of wonder begins to become uh, closed in, that it becomes inhibited. And with that, we're more civilized and we're less prone to understand or experience the wonder in life. And uh, what psilocybin does is it inhibits the inhibitory center. So it releases that capacity, not that we behave like children, but we have more of a sense of awe. And that turns people around because that's the kind of fulfillment uh, I think you may be referring to. And it's so powerful, as you're saying, psilocybin lifts the lid off the joy and wonder. Yes. And because as we get older, somehow or another, we have more of a lid on that. Yes. Is there interventions that can take place as we're getting older so that the lid isn't put on the joy and wonder, so that people can actually continue to expand and develop that capability? It's, it's much harder work, but it can be done. For example, if you're somebody who is uh, uh, a regular meditator or you do a lot of yoga, you can also release some of this inhibition and you can have a sense of much more wonder in, in the world. Religion, um, spirituality uh, helps do that as well. Uh, but it's a, it's a, believe me, it's a lot more work than taking one trip. I'm saying keep an open mind to the fact that there may be avenues uh, towards uh, uh, spiritual realization that are enabled uh, by a non-addicting and safe drug. And it sounds like a key factor of that is transcendence on some level too. There's been a lot of data showing the spiritual awakening yes. is one of the greatest predictors of success also with uh, drug recovery. Yes, and one of, uh, in my uh, various government jobs, I've had the role of leading mental health responses to major disasters. Uh, I did that as mental health commissioner here in New York City after 9-11 did that with Hurricane Sandy, which was actually a greater storm than Katrina. And it was part of our job to understand who uh, suffered the traumatic consequences of a disaster and who didn't and who had more resilience. And one of the biggest predictors of resilience was having faith that if you had faith, you were much more apt to recover from trauma, you were much more apt to recover from the disaster than not. That's amazing. What yeah. is it about faith, as you understand it, that enables people this greater resiliency? I wish I understood more about that. I, I, empirically, we've demonstrated it, but what actually happens in the brain? What is the uh, way that uh, our souls are transformed? Um, that's uh, that's beyond my pay grade. Both you and I are doctors and are trained in the Western medical model, which doesn't often include this idea of the soul. Yes. But both you and I today in our lexicon have been using that word. So I'm curious, what is your understanding of the soul and how does it relate to the Western medical model? One of the things I especially like about your work is not only your highlighting this, but also in your writing, helping people understand how to talk about this and its meaning. And one of the things we doctors need to do more of, not just psychiatrists, but mental health clinicians, primary care doctors, is ask our patients, what's important in your life? What gives you meaning? What keeps you going? Uh, what is your sense of the future? Those are hardly ever asked, even in therapy sessions. And I think that's a way to bring out uh, what is more sub substantive to a person and to help them build on that as a way of making a, a better life. So you see those questions as helping people to connect to their soul essentially and to be able to express what it is that their soul purpose is. And some or... of the exercises that you've written in your book and in other places are ways to help people outside of a therapy session take a look at themselves, take a look at what gives them meaning, take a look at what's in their a heart and what's in their mind and what's in their soul. So Lloyd, another way for us to understand our connection to our souls is through it being a part of something greater than ourselves, which could be for some people that connection is to God, 
For some people, it's to the universe. And for other people, it's a set of transcendent values like hope and perseverance mm -hmm. and love and trust. And I'm curious if you can comment on hope and perseverance, which I know you've spoken a lot about in your book. I want uh, everybody uh, listening to uh, understand that we have to keep hope alive for all kinds of chronic illnesses, including addiction. And most people actually do recover from addiction. We're not very good at predicting when that will be or what their path to recovery will be. But that's the hardest thing for an individual who relapses, for their family, for people taking care of them, to bring hope alive. For the person to rediscover their hope, for the family to hold on to hope, and for the clinician not to give up. Never give up. That is about hope, and hope is essential to people's long-term recovery. Right, and hope is so, so healing, and it's when people start to lose hope, this is what Dr. Seligman has shown, that mm -hmm. their purpose in life really just goes down. Yes. Hope is what keeps us alive. Yes. And also losing hope is a part of depression. Sometimes you need to treat the depression and then hope comes back. And you need to be yeah. surrounded by people who sustain your hope, because it's hard to do that by yourself. We have to know that we're not alone, and that there are people who love us and share our hope. Yeah, it's beautiful. So Lloyd, I want to thank you so much for being here with me today. This was such a special day and I feel like the book that you have written, The Addiction Solution, really is a gift to our field because it offers a historical perspective on what has worked and what hasn't. This is wonderful for families, the layperson, individuals, anybody who has anybody in their life suffering from any kind of addiction. It's a wonderful book. It's available on Lloyd's website, askdrlloyd.com, as well as Amazon and wherever books are sold. Thank you for your work and thank you for highlighting the problem of addiction. It's an epidemic in our country. Thank you again so much, Lloyd.